From planning a cross-country flight to analyzing the physics of a steep turn, vectors are everywhere in aviation. Despite their abundance, few subjects are as commonly avoided and misunderstood in flight training. Instead of beating around the bush, we're going to tackle this corner trigonometry head-on so that you can understand vectors enough to make use of them and maybe improve your flying knowledge along the way. I hope this explanation makes the seemingly daunting subject a little more manageable. Merriam-Webster's dictionary defines a vector as a quantity that has size and direction. The example given is velocity, which is also where I normally start this discussion. After departing the Greenville Airport's airspace for training flights, I usually proceed north towards the Appalachian Mountains since this provides an excellent area for maneuvers. Depending on the aircraft and winds, 100 knots is a fairly typical speed. This explanation of the aircraft's northbound ground track and 100 nautical mile per hour speed contains the same information as a vector. Instead of saying or writing north at 100 knots, I could simply draw a vector on a map to represent this same information. To do this, I draw an arrow starting at the aircraft's current position, then pointing north. The longer the arrow, the bigger the value, in this case, speed. So a vector is simply an arrow which represents direction and how much of some value it possesses. Vectors can represent moving things, in the case of velocity, but they can also represent forces, such as the four fundamentals in aviation, weight, drag, thrust, and lift. You may have even already seen vectors being used to show these in previous training. They're simply a way to visually represent things that move or push in a certain direction. The first advantage of using vectors is being able to compare values at a glance. If a faster aircraft, such as an Aerostar, were flying right next to me doing 200 knots while also going straight north, its arrow, or vector, would be twice as long. Without thinking, you can not only see that the Aerostar is faster, but also get an idea of how much faster it is. This also works with forces. In a Shanghai Aircraft Design and Research Institute study, a Cessna 172 with a 150 horsepower engine produced about 465 pounds of thrust at full throttle while stationary. Just like with velocity, an engine producing 930 pounds of thrust would have a vector that is twice as long while positioned in the same direction. Providing a helpful way of writing and comparing things that have size and direction is not the only advantage of using vectors. To demonstrate this next one, Let's say I was flying northwest on a heading of 330 degrees instead of directly north. The aircraft is still moving at 100 knots, but how quickly is it moving just north? Or how about just south? The answer to these questions comes from vector components. You may have heard of crosswind components while studying landings, and vector components are exactly what these are. Looking at our aircraft heading northwest, you can draw the vector just like before, but angled at a 330 heading instead of 360 degrees otherwise known as north. From here, this new vector can be broken down into its two components, or pieces, which form a right triangle. As you can see, an aircraft moving northwest has a north and a west component added together to make the final northwest heading. This is simply a different way to think about the universe, but it has very real impacts. In this example, the aircraft would move 86.6 nautical miles north and 50 nautical miles west every hour on its current heading. Finding those exact numbers requires more advanced trigonometry, but that is not really necessary for a pilot. Simply understanding what vector components are and where they come from is all I believe you need for solid flying. Let's apply this to those crosswind landings. Many instructors assign a maximum crosswind component when allowing their students to fly solo. If their student does not truly understand what a vector component is, then it could lead to problems. Say a student is about to perform their first solo flight and is limited by their instructor to a 7-knot crosswind component. This is not the instructor being cruel, but simply keeping their student safe. The difficulty of crosswind landings comes from vector components, not just the wind speed. To demonstrate this, think of an answer to this question. Which is more difficult to land in, winds of 10 or 20 knots? The answer is that it depends. A steady 20-knot wind straight down the runway is not bad, while a 10-knot wind directly across that runway can be difficult. This is why a 7-knot crosswind component limitation is fairly reasonable for a first solo. On the day of the flight, wind is forecasted to be from a 050 degree heading at 9 knots. A common misconception would occur if the students saw that 9 is greater than their 7-knot maximum and cancel the flight, but this may not have been necessary. Using a wind component chart instead, this wind vector can be broken down into its components, headwind and crosswind. First, the runway heading is needed. Using these winds, runway 1 at the Gulf Mike Uniform Airport would be the best option. 
adding a zero to the runway number gives an approximate runway heading of 0, 010 0 degrees or 10 degrees. Winds from 0, 050 0 means they are blowing at a 40 degree angle relative to the runway. This can be determined by finding the difference between the wind and the runway headings. In this case, it's simply 50 minus 10. With a wind component chart, using the curve for 10 knots, then going slightly less for about 9, then following where this crosses the 40 degree line, which was that angle between the wind and the runway, straight down to the crosswind component shows just under 6 knots. This means that the crosswind is actually within limits and the solo flight can be conducted safely. That said, it is only one knot short of the 7 knot maximum, which may be cause for concern if anything changes, but that is a discussion for another day. To understand what the wind component chart just did, let's draw the vector for the wind. From a heading of 050 degrees at 9 knots, we can see the angle it crosses the runway. Using the runway heading as our reference line, the wind vector could be broken down into a vector that is aligned with that runway and another that is across it. As before, trigonometry could be used to find the exact values, but a wind component chart is far easier. These simple charts do the hard work for you, so all you have to do is note how far off the wind is from the runway and how strong it is. From there, the amount of that wind that is acting as a crosswind can be calculated. Even after the student pilot stage, this is an extremely helpful skill because aircraft can only handle certain crosswind components before landing is unsafe. For a Cessna 172, this is about 15 knots. So above that, a landing could be dangerous. Again, this is a crosswind component, not total wind. A Cessna 172 can be landed relatively easily in 30 knot winds, which is twice the maximum component, if those winds are steady and aligned exactly with the runway. Crosswind components, like vectors, come from considering both direction and how fast the air is moving. The last area I want to talk about vectors is induced drag, another commonly misunderstood topic. Reference materials on it often say induced drag is an inevitable part of lift and that it is higher when planes fly slower, but where these explanations often fall short is the why behind it. Before making sense of induced drag, lift and drag need to be defined. Yes, lift is created by the wings, and drag slows the plane down, but more specifically, lift is a force that acts at a 90 degree angle to the relative wind, in other words, the air passing around the aircraft. To put that differently, any force that pulls the aircraft up relative to its direction of travel is lift. Drag, however, is aligned with the flight path, but acts in the opposite direction and pulls the aircraft back. With these two definitions in mind, consider the wings of the airplane. In straight and level flight, the lift vector, or the direction of the upward force created by the wings, is not perfectly straight up. Instead, it is angled backwards slightly. Breaking down this angled vector yields a large component that is lift and a smaller one that is drag because it is acting backwards. This smaller vector component, a part of the force created by the wings, is induced drag. It is simply the drag component vector created because the wings lift is angled backwards. The higher the angle of attack or angle between the wing and flight path, the more the lift is angled backwards and the higher the induced drag. Because larger angles are needed to stay level at lower speeds, induced drag rises as an aircraft slows down in level flight. This is simply a brief introduction to the issue of induced drag, but I hope your knowledge of vectors allowed it to make more sense. To recap, a vector is simply an arrow that shows the direction of a force, movement, or some other quantity, as well as how strong it is or how fast it is moving. Vectors can be broken down into components or pieces, which are simply two smaller vectors that are equivalent to the original when added together. These components are used in wind and heading calculations, aerodynamics, and even simply turning an airplane. I hope this explanation demystified an often overcomplicated math subject and its importance to aviation. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you have a nice day.